All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. I am Matt Hiraga. I'm going to be your instructor for this next course and session. I wanted to start off with an introduction of myself so you understand who I am, where I came from, and why I'm qualified to teach you. Um, I'm born and raised in Hawaii. I actually grew up on the west side in Maili. Uh, when I started going to school, my family relocated to the Salty Lakes. Uh, I live in Salt Lake now. Um, I have five kids because I thought I needed more stress in my life. And uh, so I really have a reason to stay safe. I don't stay safe because it's in the title or uh, I'm an instructor. It's I understand that I have responsibilities at home. Now, I spent most of my career off in construction. My dad owns a construction company. So he started me up on the roof at nine years old. Um, at a nine-year-old, he had me doing concrete and framing and drywall and electrical and plumbing. And honestly, uh, I knew zero about safety for a long, long time and I did things and I got hurt and we got the scars to prove it. But uh, nowadays, when you get a little bit older and a little bit wiser, you kind of realize that, you know what, this thing is important. Aside the fact that the violations are ginormous and huge, it's at the end of the day, our life is priceless. So first section we're gonna get into today is uh, fall protection. This is at a competent person level and I'm gonna let you know right now, I'd recommend you definitely take notes um, there's going to be a competency test at the end, and that's to prove that, yes, the student who completes this course has the appropriate knowledge, so that's something you want to prepare yourself for. And keep in mind, we are doing this for a certification. The certification will be emailed, as well as a hard copy sent out to you upon completion. At the end of the day, competency is required by OSHA, and we'll get into the actual definitions for that. So I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, we're going to share a screen with you. You're going to be able to see the slideshow the entire time. Um, you'll be hearing my voice the entire time. Hope that's okay. And then we'll get you guys some uh, some knowledge. So I'm going to dip right into there. And now we're looking at the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, again, is Fall Prevention and Protection. It's under OSHA's 1926 subpart M. So 1926 just lets you know it is a construction standard. And within that standard in subpart M, it covers everything related to fall protection. So you need to take a look at this. Here's some basic knowledge and information you have to have for yourself. At the very least, you gotta know when is fall protection required. So take a look at the following locations. The first location is construction. Now construction is when you're building, you're, you're framing, you're putting up a, uh, you know, a roof, things like that, you're considered the construction industry. Now, this is the most common trigger height that you'll hear when you ask people, hey, at what height is fall protection required? And the answer for this is six feet. And I can tell you this definitely will be on the test. All these regulations and all these height requirements, you absolutely have to know. But let's take a look at the next industry, and that's the general industry. General industry would be like servicing or maintenance. An HVAC guy that's got to clean out some filters. Uh, your painter who may have to come and do touch-up painting on a windowsill. Uh, even the lady at Walmart who's going to climb up a, a ladder to grab you something off the shelf. Now, they can fall. They do fall under general industry regulations. And what do you think that trigger height is set at? Is it the same as construction at six feet? Is it going to be higher? Is it going to be lower? And then why? So take a look here. The general industry actually sets their trigger height requirement at four feet or 48 inches. Now, the reason they did this is they didn't roll a bunch of dice and hope for the best. They took a look at fatality statistics. And for example, in the construction industry, when people are falling, statistically, they start to die at above seven feet, which is where they found that trigger height of six feet. But in the general industry, they're finding people maybe mopping floors or I needed to do uh, change a light bulb out using a small ladder. In the general industry, the fatalities were happening at a much lower height. So the assumption is they don't have as much experience. Therefore, that trigger height is set lower. Now, there are some additions that you would think, okay, well, this is probably covered in construction or general industry. Take a look at when you're looking at aerial lifts, a boom lift, a telehandler, a man lift, an order selector, if you work in a warehouse or even if you work at somewhere like Home Depot and you got to go up to grab a door off the shelf, at what height is fall protection required on an aerial lift? And the answer for this is actually always. It doesn't matter if you're an inch off the ground, 
or a foot off the ground, it requires fall protection at any height. Now take a look at the next one here, supported scaffolds. Scaffolds are very important to know the regulations of because of how OSHA defines a scaffold. A scaffold is actually defined as an elevated work platform. So anything that is elevated for you to work off of can be considered a scaffold. If you took two five gallon buckets and you ran a plank across it, that's a platform elevated for you to work on and OSHA looks at that as a scaffold. Or what if I'm in a warehouse and my forklift driver picks a pallet up and I jump up on that pallet? That's considered a mobile scaffold in the eyes of OSHA because it is an elevated working platform that you can access jobs or access locations to and you have to follow the regulations. Here's the funny thing is scaffolding is not in subpart M with fault protection. It's actually in subpart L of scaffolds and it requires and it has a trigger height set at 10 feet. So that means that 10 feet Either you need to start adding the railings or guardrails, or you need to use some type of fall protection, whether it be a personal fall arrest system, your body harness, a, a lanyard of some sort, and a, you know, an anchor point. But we're gonna get into the specific details so that you can identify the different types of fall protection systems. Taking a look next, well, what if I'm on a suspended scaffold? A suspended scaffold is something that's hanging, typically, a window washer or maybe painters of a building would work off of suspended scaffolds because there is a higher chance or a higher risk of failure or falling. Suspended scaffolds actually also require fall protection always and at any height. So moving on, looking at the different types of fall protection systems. So one system you have an active system and it has to stop the employee's fall and limit the fall to specific distance and it will limit the amount of force a person is subject in the event of a fall. So examples of an active system would be like a lifeline. If I'm hanging on a suspended scaffold and the scaffold fails, I'll be on a lifeline. A work positioning device. Maybe I climbed an electric pole because I'm working on a breaker. Maybe I am doing steel erection and I'm tying off in front of me to some uh, some rods or, or, or some piping. Those are all work position devices. And then of course on the bottom, it's your personal fall arrest system. And you see there in parentheses, it says ABCs. ABCs represent the three major things you have to have in order to complete the system. A represent an anchor point, a point of anchor is somewhere to tie off to. B is your body wear, your body harness, or in some rare cases, you can use body belts and then C, some type of connecting device. And then the other type of system you have is the passive system, and that's a physical barrier that restricts the worker from entering a fall hazard. An example of this would be perimeter guardrails. You're never gonna have to be caught after a fall because it doesn't allow you to fall. It blocks you from the fall. Now they do have safety nets, and these are screens that can be put up to block workers. They have hole covers. Maybe there was a skylight that got removed. Maybe there's just a big gap or, or we're doing some concrete cutting, exposing a hole. We can use hole covers as a passive system. And then safety monitors. Safety monitors we'll get into a little bit, uh, a little later on in the presentation. So looking at this uh, image here, it says, when do you need fall protection? Well, fall protection is required when you are within six feet of an unprotected roof edge, or if you're working in an unguarded mezzanine and balcony edges. So mezzanines actually end up catching a lot of people, especially at your warehouse. Should OSHA show up and do uh, an inspection of your warehouse and they notice a bunch of boxes or a bunch of equipment or insulation sitting on the top of your warehouse mezzanines and there's no fall protection present, they're gonna start questioning your policies, your written programs, and of course your employee protection. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this roof here. Um, you gotta imagine, all right, we're gonna be removing the black tar paper. You gotta be able to identify your hazards. Now, one thing that OSHA requires with most subjects is you have an on-site competent person. Your competent person is someone who through skills, training, knowledge, experience, has the the ability to recognize an existing hazard 
or a predictable hazard and then has authority to stop work. Well, who gives them authority? Is it OSHA that gives them authority? Is it your talented instructor who's talking into a microphone that gives you authority? No, it's actually the company that you work for is the only one who can give an employee authority. They're basically saying, you know what? We're gonna take responsibility for the decisions that he makes, the system he decides to use, and should anything happen, it's on us because we believe he is competent. So take a look at this image here. You gotta imagine access and egress to the site is gonna be the most important thing. So when actually looking at this, I've got a door here, right here that leads up from the stairwell. I could use a roof hatch, which is inconveniently positioned uh, about a foot away. It has a little six inch trip hazard that you might go over the parapet or I can run an extension ladder right up the side. As a competent person, what access am I gonna to use to this roof? And hopefully most competent people say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the door hatch from the stairwell. Keep in mind, we will be working up here in this black area. And now because there is no tow boards, there's no parapet, this may become an overhead hazard for anybody walking through that door. So this is where signage or the job site pre-task takes place where it says, look, before entering the roof access to the door, hard hat required, overhead hazard, right? You have to think of all the injuries or accidents that could possibly happen. Now, once we get on the roof, we can start to determine what kind of fall protection system can we use? Now, if you look on the edge here, yeah, there's a little gray parapet. A parapet is just defined as a raised roof edge. Can we use the parapet as fall protection? And I'm gonna tell you right now from experience, from having to do with giant general contractors down to small mom and pop operations and working with OSHA constantly. I've had more inspections than I even want to admit to. And it has nothing to do with us doing anything wrong. It's just, you know what? We work on a lot of big projects a lot of high profile projects and they show up. Your favorite word right now should be depends. When you get older, you may not like depends too much, but for right now, your favorite word should be depends. So if somebody asks, hey, can we use that parapet wall for fall protection so we don't have to tie off, we're gonna be working in the sun, I don't wanna drag ropes around this dirty roof, it's gonna get damaged or cut. Uh, your answer as a competent person should be, well, it depends. And what does it depend on? Well, it depends on the height of the parapet wall and then the strength of the parapet wall. But we'll kind of get into that when you look at guardrails or railings. And we also have the fall hazard here, which is skylights. Now, the way that OSHA looks at skylights, it's a hole. It doesn't matter if it's covered in glass, if it's covered in plastic, it's a hole. So you have to protect your worker from falling through the hole. And there are some options there. Now, one option, if we wanted to look at, okay, how can I per protect the perimeter of my building? Well, we can go ahead and install vertical posts. You can use two by fours, four by fours. They have things called slab grabbers that are actually clamp onto that parapet. And then you gotta run railings or guardrails across. Now here's where you're gonna kind of understand, could we have used the parapet wall? A standard height guardrail, which is where I'm showing you here with this little brown um, box I got going. The standard height guardrail, if you were to measure the very top where your hand would rest or where your hand could slide across, the very top should be at 42 inches plus or minus three. That means you can go up as high as 45 and you can go as low as 39. So your answer from earlier where it says depends, hey Matt, can I use the parapet as fall protection depends. How high is it? If they said it was, oh, it's 38 inches, then my answer would be, no, you can't. But does that mean I have to go, okay, you got to buy harnesses and lanyards and retractables? There's always a way where you can kind of solve that problem. If I took two by fours and laid it flat down on that 38 inch parapet, fastened it in there with, you know, tap con or concrete screws. Now I have 39 half. Can I use it as fall protection? My answer then would be, yeah, absolutely. As long as you meet the 42 inches plus or minus three. So minimum 39 is really where you're looking. Now you have to have a mid rail. And the reason why I say you have to have a mid rail 
is what the standard says is if there's ever a gap, a gap from here, the bottom of the top rail to wherever the opening is, if this gap here is ever bigger than 19 inches, you require a mid rail. Well, if the lowest I can make it is 39 and I'm using a two by four, so they're going to give me, you know, three and a half, I'm still going to be above 35 inches in gap when I measure it. So I want to make sure that I put a mid rail and the mid rail, take a guess at where that thing goes. It goes midway in between. If you put your top row at 42, put your mid row at 21. If you put your top row at 40, put your mid row at 20. Simple, right? So that is a, a form of fall protection. Now, is a tote board required is the next question you should ask. And again, like I said, your favorite answer should be depends. Depends on what is wherever your working area is, if there's going to be vehicular traffic or pedestrian traffic working below and there's a possibility for something to fall, then you should put a tow board in. And the requirements they made for tow boards conveniently is three and a half inches off the ground, which is the standard two by fours width. And you can allow for a quarter inch gap at the bottom, assuming your floor is not going to be perfectly level. So tow boards again, and this will be on your task, are required if there's vehicular or pedestrian traffic below you. Another way to avoid this would be to set up some kind of blockade or delineators, creating a controlled area with red danger tape, signage, right? Do not enter overhead work taking place. Um, hard hats require authorized personnel only, whatever you need to do so that somebody doesn't come streaming through your building looking up and confused and gets caught in the head with something. Okay, so let's take a look here now at the additional fall hazard and we can wrap these railings obviously around the entire building. An additional fall hazard would be the skylights. Again, it's considered a hole. Now an option you have for skylights is you could set up a warning system. Now if you set up a flag warning system like this, um, you should know a few things. This can only be done on a low sloped roof. So that's something that's 212 pitch or less. For this example, the roof is flat, which we can do. And then you need to worry about, well, how far does this space need to be from where my line ends up to where the actual fall hazard is? Here's your answer. If you're only utilizing hand tools, scrapers, I'm using a Burke bar, I'm using a hammer and chisel, hand tools, that needs to be kept back at a minimum six feet distance. Now, if you're gonna use power tools, a walk behind saw, a target saw, something like that, then you actually have to push that warning line back to 10 feet. So the six feet is hand tools, 10 feet is any type of powered equipment used on the roof. Now, one thing that most people I believe forget when they use these visual warning lines is it says you have to have a safety monitor. So you have to have somebody positioned to where they can see the line, ensure that all workers are staying on the outside or inside of the line, depending on how you set it up. And if they come too close, your safety monitor says, hey, Johnny, you gotta get away from my line. See, the problem is, is most companies don't pay for a safety monitor to stand there and watch the line. And as a safety professional, you know what I call that guy in the industry? He's your first witness. These flag lines are never gonna stop anybody from actually falling over the edge or into the hole, but it's more for a visual, hey, you're getting within six feet of the, of the hazard. You're getting within 10 feet of the hazard. But what like a lot of people do is if you fall, or you slip or you trip because of the walking working surface or I stepped on a line or I lost my footing, you don't fall straight down and crumble, right? You, you trip, you stumble, you try and regain your balance. And that six foot, honestly, is eliminated quickly when that happens. So you want to use this. Yeah, it looks good from the edge of the building and it looks good if OSHA drives by, um, but it doesn't actually stop the worker or prevent the worker from experiencing a fall. So another way we could uh, actually take care of the skylight is possibly putting on a hole cover. Now, hole cover, the way that it's written in the standard, it needs to be able to withstand two times the maximum intended load. And that's going to be on your test. 
So whatever you put on it, I'm going to put me and, and Kimo and brother Johnny over there. We're going to be standing on this in order to work above. And together we weigh 700 pounds. Then the standard says that better be able to support 1400 pounds, two times the maximum intended load. It should be secured to prevent it from shifting. That means if I got to put screws into the deck, if I got to, you know, um, bolt it down, however, it needs to be secured from shifting. And then you have to paint, write, or put some type of signage that identifies it as a hole cover. Now, this is something you want to keep simple. The words you want to put on something like a hole cover are going to be either hole or cover. You want to make it easily legible and easily read. Now, being in the 808 state, can we put puka on the whole cover? What's your favorite answer in fault protection or in construction? It should be depends. If I write puka on there, every single person on your job site, general contractors, subcontractors, visitors, the inspectors need to know what it means. Puka. If you ask somebody who's visiting from Nashville, Tennessee, hey man, check out this sign, he's, what the hell's puka? Then you're out of luck, right? You need to make it so everybody can understand, but OSHA recognizes English as the universal language. So it doesn't matter even if they can't read English, that is gonna be a sufficient sign. So keep it to whole. And just as a bonus knowledge here, whole is H-O-L-E. If you put W-H-O-L-E, you better dip some cookies into it. If you put H-O-E, you better have a nice gold chain around your neck. But you want to make sure you spell it correctly. Okay, H-O-L-E. Now let's get into your personal fall arrest system. This is the most common type of fall protection that employers use because it's relatively low cost. They're fairly universal and they work. So a personal fall arrest system is used to arrest the employee in a, in a fall from any working level. When stopped, the fall shall be rigged so that the worker can neither free fall more than six feet nor contact any other lower level. So free falling six feet, I feel is, uh, a lot of people make that mistake because they go out and they buy a six foot lanyard and they assume I can't fall more than six feet. But when you really look into the six foot lanyard, if you were to attach that to your rear dorsal D-ring on your back and clip it off to an anchor point that's anywhere below your back, you're gonna free fall more than six feet. You imagine if I was standing on an I-beam and I clipped it onto the floor where my feet are and I jumped off the I-beam. When the time my back D-ring reaches the I-beam, that would have been the six foot lanyard length. And then I still gotta go another six foot, so that's a 12 foot free fall. Most lanyards say that it has to be, your anchor point should be at or above the height of your D-ring. So you really want to look into that. If it's not possible, then you got to buy a special lanyard. They make the big boss lanyards or they make 12 foot lanyards. When you look at the actual label of a lanyard and you see six feet, read what it says directly under that. It'll say maximum free fall distance. It doesn't mean it's actually a six foot long lanyard it says maximum free fall distance. If you're tying off below your D-ring, it better have a higher maximum free fall. And then keep in mind, all fall protection equipment, components, your lanyards, retractables, the webbing of your harness is all a minimum breaking strength of 5,000 pounds. Now you do have other types of systems, but when you're looking at here, it says fall arrest versus fall restraint, or it says arrest versus restraint. Fall arrest is a system like this picture here to the left, where it's a system that it'll let you fall. It's got to then catch you before you hit the ground or the lower level. You're not supposed to free fall more than six feet, if you remember, and then it arrest the forces that your body feels. But if I'm in restraint, restraint would be like these two pictures at the bottom. Either I have a lanyard that's sufficiently short to where I would not be able to reach the fall, so it restrains me, or I use a rope in the rope grab, which is also known as a vertical lifeline. I let the rope grab go, locking it to the rope, and then it restrains me from falling. 
fall arrest has to catch you, fall restraint stops you from walking to the edge. So think to yourself, because this will be on the test, which anchor point do you think needs to be stronger? If I'm in fall arrest, where it's got to catch me, or if I'm in fall restraint. Obviously, arrest should probably be stronger then, right? So let's take a look at what the strength requirements is. If you are in arrest, the anchor point that you install has to be able to withstand 5,000 pounds of force per person. Now, if I'm a 250 pound guy, I'm nowhere near 5,000 pounds, but when you free fall of a maximum six feet and you put tension on that line, it hits with a big amount of force and it gets very close to that 5,000, which is why that's the requirement as far as the strength. Now, if you were using restraint, a short lanyard, a vertical lifeline and you tied off to where you couldn't fall, it actually only needs to be a 1,000 pound anchor point. So think about where you can use this. If you're on a roof and I gotta check, I gotta remove some caulking around a vent because it's leaking, but there's no anchor point in the roof. Do I get one and screw a bunch of holes in and increase the chance of a leak? Or maybe I can look around. Hey, look, I noticed some solar panels here. Can I cross arm strap or tie around the rails of the solar panels? And what would my answer be? Depends. How strong is the solar panel? Can I call the company who installed it? Possibly. Imagine I called, okay, I called Revolution. Hey, Revolution, um, how strong is this panel at so-and-so's address? And they're going to be able to look up the information on what they installed and, and the type of bracket. Well, Matt, you know, this is rated for hurricane winds and a hundred pound panel. That rail will sit, hold about 4,000 pounds of force. Can I use it for fall protection? And the answer should be depends. If I'm using it in fall arrest, can I use it? You should say no, right? Because fall arrest needs a 5,000 pound anchor. And they told me it was 4,000. But look, if I use the restraint system, hey, now I can put four guys on that roof without having to put any additional holes because I found a way to utilize my resource. Make sense? So the personal fall arrest system consists of the following, your ABCs. A, you have to have an anchor point, a point of anchorage. B, you have to have body harness, or like I said, you can use body belts. Body belts, the standard, you have to be able to minimize your free fall to two feet. A tree climber can use a body belt. Somebody at Hawaiian Telecom or Hawaiian Electric can use a body belt as long as they don't free fall more than two feet. Or if I was in a bucket lift, if I'm in a bucket lift and I tied off to the floor with a sufficiently short lanyard, okay, I can use a body belt. And then C, you need connectors or a connecting device like lanyards, a lifeline, and where it says SRL, that's a self-retracting lifelines, also known as retractables to some or yo-yos to some. Okay, so here are some examples and just some pictures on the bottom so that you can see an anchor point, a harness, and a retractable. So an anchor point is a secure point of attachments for lifelines, lanyards, or deceleration devices it must be independent of any other anchorage being used for equipment tiebacks. It must be an independent, independent means of supporting or suspending a worker. And it has to be capable of at least 5,000 pounds of support. Sound anchorages include certified roof anchors as well as structural members. So now it says structural member. So if I go down to Hawaiian Airlines and they want me to do an inspection of the airplane wings. Can I tie off to the overhead I-beam of that hangar and be sufficient and OSHA compliant? What do you think the answer is gonna be? Depends. Can I prove in writing that anchor point can support the system that I'm using? So the way that OSHA works, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. If I don't send you a certificate at the end of this trading, you never took it. 
You didn't listen to it. You didn't take a test, right? I need to be able to issue you in writing a successful completion. So what they're saying is that if you went into the uh, warehouse and you called a structural engineer and he came out and he said, yeah, Matt, this I-beam holds 96,000 pounds. It's holding the building up. They can go ahead and paint 5,000 pounds on the I-beam. And why do you think they paint 5,000 pounds? That's just telling you that it is sufficient for a fall arrest anchor point. And if I wasn't in arrest and, and we were going to use restraint, vertical lifelines or something that keeps us on the wings, then I could put five guys on there because I only need the 1,000 pounds per worker. Here's an example of an improper anchorage. Uh, you can't use standard guardrails or railings as an improper, as, as an anchor point. Um, you shouldn't use ladder rungs, scaffolding, unless it's designed for it in some cases. Light fixtures, not a good idea. Conduit or plumbing, duct work, pipe vents, HVAC, satellite dishes, or anything else that you're not sure of, regardless if it's a certified anchor point, which is manufactured by the fall protection companies, or a non-certified anchor point. Here's another example of a non-certified anchor point. Can I try, uh, tie around to the rear bumper of my work truck? What's your answer? Depends. Can the rear bumper of my work truck sufficiently support the system I'm using? Arrest 5,000 pounds, restraint 1,000 pounds. And if you can prove in writing your bumper will support that weight, you can technically use it. Keep in mind there are a lot of other restrictions about using a vehicle. You would have to utilize wheel chocks. You would have to utilize lockout, tag out, which is a steering wheel cover. And I tell you what, if you're going to be tied off to that rear bumper, you better have the keys of the vehicle in your pocket. So somebody doesn't have to take a 7-Eleven run and you go for a little ride. So let's talk about your B, full body harness. It must be the right size for you. The attachment point of the body harness shall be located. So it says the rear D-ring should be between your shoulders when working from a suspended scaffold or an aerial lift. So between your shoulders, they're measuring left to right here. The lowest your D-ring should ever be is actually between your shoulder blades. Anything higher works better, but when you start dipping below the shoulder blades on that D-ring, when you fall, you start to flip upside down. And hanging right side up sucks enough. Upside down, you start running into a whole bunch of other problems. So make sure it is sufficiently high and then centered from left to right. The harness must be adjusted snugly, and we'll walk you through that, starting with the leg straps, then the waist, then the shoulders, and then last is the chest. There's actually an order these fall protection manufacturers recommend you put it on, and because it's a recommendation in their tabulated data, you can get an OSHA violation for doing it incorrectly or backwards. Now, one thing you need to understand is that, and this will be on the test, it needs to be inspected. And the first question the inspectors are typically asking workers on the field is, hey, I notice you're wearing fall protection. How often do you inspect it? And the first answer workers typically jump to is uh, oh, every day. You check it every day. You don't check it every day. You don't check it on Sundays when you're at church. You're not going to check it on your birthday or Christmas or your anniversary, right? You don't say I check it every day. The correct answer, I check it prior to each use. Hey, Matt, how often you check your harness? I check it prior to each use. So if I come in in the morning, I inspect it before I go up. And if I take it off before we go to lunch, guess what I'm doing when we come back? I'm inspecting it again because anything could have happened to it. Somebody could have accidentally dropped the saws on the harness because they really wanted to run to the lunch wagon with you and they were super hungry. I mean, anything could happen. Your inspection does not have to be documented, but it should be done. Every six months, a competent person should be inspecting your harness. And this is more of a double check. This is something that will be documented using an inspection form. And you don't have to use the manufacturer's inspection forms, but they are designed for that exact purpose. You can download these directly from their websites at no cost. 
print up as many as you need. And remember, if it's not in writing, it does not exist. Competent person can say, yeah, man, I checked my whole crew today. If it wasn't noted or written down, it did not happen. So remember, you inspect it prior to each use for you authorized users and every six months for a competent person. Now, every single harness comes in a bag and in that bag, a white booklet. Sometimes it's gray. If you have a different color, then you ordered it from a different country, but it has a booklet. And all I want you guys to do is attempt to read the very first page. Typically, it's going to say something along these lines. Do not throw away these instructions, exclamation point, because they're yelling at you. It says read and understand these instructions before using my equipment, exclamation point. In all bold, highlighted, sometimes underlined letters, they're really trying to hammer that point home. The reason is, is it tells you how to inspect it. When does it expire? How do you remove it from service? What things to look for? But I'm gonna show you here how the actual inspection is done before you use it. Now you see I have it in four different areas. The first thing you inspect on your harness is the tags. And the reason why I say the tags is some fault protection equipment has a set service life. A typical example, when you read it, it'll say, date of first use blank. And you're supposed to write the date of first use there. And you would only know that if you read the booklet it came with, unless you took a good guess. Date of first use blank, product lifetime is five years from the date of first use. So the reason I always check the tag first is because if it's expired, guess what? Your inspection is done and then you can now cut the harness and remove it from service. I cut the harness to remove my liability so it doesn't end up in the trash can and somebody jumps in the trash can and posts it on Craigslist or offer up for 20 bucks and you see it circulating around and somebody buys the damn thing. Data first use blank. But then it goes on to say, if it's not recorded five years from the manufacturer's date, well, they make these harnesses by the millions. And here in beautiful Hawaii, we don't buy them by the millions. They may order from a safety company 40 harnesses. And then my ABC contracting goes down and I only need two harnesses from my new guys. It may sit in the manufacturer's warehouse for a year before it ships to what, two years? It may sit at the store for another year and a half. You may have bought it, but you know what? The other guy, he never showed up to work. So put his harness in the closet and then it sits there for six months. You never want to end up in a situation where you have a harness that you can use five minutes because the date of first use was not recorded. Okay, so start with the tags expiration dates and servicing requirements on there. The second thing you want to make sure all of your hardware is in good working order. Now, when I say hardware, I mean your D rings, your chest straps, your leg straps, any metal components. When you look at it, it shouldn't have cracks. It shouldn't be bent. It shouldn't have twists or fractures and it shouldn't have any pitted rust. Pitted rust starts to cut into the webbing that inevitably rubs against the metal components. They're, they're connected, they're stitched to it, okay? Um, on the number three, it says inspect your webbing for cuts, wear, burns. From, burns could be from cigarettes, burns could be from welding, any frayed edges or other damage. And I can tell you right now, the first thing OSHA looks for is any writing on the harness. Because in the book, the manufacturer says do not right on my harness. But you go to any job site and you'll see uh, killer, makaboy, uomao, ke'eo, okaena, ikapono. There's all kind of writing on the equipment, but it is illegal. And, and you ask these guys, well, why did you write on your equipment? Oh, um, so I knew it was mine. Perfect. So then I guess you should go out and key your car too then so you know it was yours because you ain't the only one with a Toyota Tacoma, right? It has built-in name tags on all harnesses made after 2011. It says this harness belongs to, and it typically gives you a big old blank line that you can write on it. Solvent from the ink 
is going to affect the strength of the nylon webbing. You're making it worse. You're making it higher chance of failing by writing on it. So please take your art talents elsewhere and keep it off of the fall protection equipment. And then number four, you inspect all the stitching for abrasion, wear to assure the integrity. Put it this way, you shouldn't have any string sticking up looking at you. Once that string is cut, ripped, or damaged, it needs to be replaced. The harness needs to be taken out of service. So here's how you put the harness on step by step. It says take the adjustment out of the front straps located below and increase the size of the harness. That means you take every single adjustment and you loosen it up as much as you possibly can for the first time you put it on to get an accurate fit. Now in step two, you should hang the shoulder straps over your shoulders like a backpack and always ensure that the subpelvic strap rests underneath your pelvic area. It's the butt strap or ilemu if you want to get correct with it, local style. It's not okole, right? It's ilemu. But the butt strap should be under your butt cheeks, okay? Remember what we talked about earlier. The D-ring is centered in your back here, right? And no lower than where your shoulder blades are, okay? So if your shoulder blades are here, my connection is here, and he is still sufficient. From there, you actually work your way from the bottom up, and you do your leg straps. Now, you notice in this picture, his right arm is coming across to check his left leg because you want to be perpendicular to the strap. You should be able to stick your hand into the leg strap, but you should not be able to make a fist. And if you can make a fist, it is too loose and it needs to be tightened up. When you wear 5,000 pound webbing straps too loose, it starts to sit further down your leg. If you fall, these, la these straps both come up and they cross over and you put 5,000 pound scissors in between your legs. Now, unless you didn't want kids and you didn't have the medical to cover that surgery or procedure, I suggest you wear the harness correctly. You can go ahead and do your other leg from there, repeat with opposite hand, and then you can start adjusting those uh, torso straps or the shoulder strap. So basically when you stand straight up and down, you should not be able to pull straps more than two inches off of your shoulders. You can pull it more than two off of your shoulders. It is too loose and you can end up hurting yourself should you ever experience a fall. So you need to tighten that up. And then the last thing you would adjust here is the chest strap. The chest strap is located at the center of your chest, which is between the nipples. Center of your chest, between the nipples. Okay. If you wear it too high and you fall, higher chance of you choking yourself out. If you wear it too low, and you fall. Your stomach area, you have a high chance of internal bleeding, and it actually makes it more difficult to breathe when you're suspended, okay? So here's what the actual uh, harness looks like when you have it on. If you notice, his chest strap is straight across the chest around nipple height. His legs are sufficiently tight. His pelvic strap is in the right area, and his dorsal D-ring is also in the appropriate height. We're moving on to C, which is your connecting devices. So here are just some examples of lanyards. You can take a look at some of the images on the screen. This is your standard lanyard with a shock pack here. When you ever see these wrinkly looking lanyards where they have the little ruffles in them, that means it is an internal shock pack. It's still going to extend and get longer. It's an internal shock pack. And then at the bottom here, that's just an extension. Some guys with big muscles cannot reach where their dorsal D-ring would normally have to clip on. So your option is asking for help. Or you can get an 18-inch extension, which would position the ring at your lower back, just above your, your butt, and uh, you can clip off there. But the actual connection point is still at the center of your back above your shoulder blades. Now here's the thing about connecting devices. Remember what it said in the standard earlier. Needs to be sufficiently short to where you can only experience a maximum free fall distance of at least six feet. And it has to prevent you from hitting the ground or the lower level. So if there's a balcony below you, you can't hit it. 
So let's take, for example, if, if I bought the most common connecting device in the construction industry is a six foot lanyard with a shock pad. What they're going to tell you to do and this calculation is in a colored picture directly in the brochure it comes with, but I'm going to show you here anyway. It says you need to take the length of the lanyard and that was a six foot lanyard. So this is saying how high does my anchor point need to be off the ground so I don't go out, right? A six foot lanyard. Now I said it has a shock pack and if you don't know what a shock pack is, they just take the same nylon webbing, they overlap it to itself, stitch it together so if you ever fall, you're not just hitting one solid rope or a solid piece of nylon web, it actually rip open, it rips open and it elongates to slow down the fall before you stop. It's similar to ABS brakes. It slows you down before the tires lock up. Well, the shock pack on standard lanyards nowadays after 2011 is a four foot deceleration device or a 48 inch shock pack. So if you're taking your calculation already, I just gave my worker a standard lanyard with a shock pack on it. He needs six foot compensation for the length of the lanyard plus an additional four feet for the shock pack. Another thing you have to calculate in is if you're clipping it to your back and it's going to stretch a little, you're going to have some, some flex in that harness. It typically pulls above your head. You should at the very least calculate your worker height. And in this case, I've got a six foot worker height. Now I'm already at 16 feet, but if I say set my anchor point to 16 feet, and I have any stretch, any bounce or flex in my line, guess who has a broken ankle or a cracked hip bone and is not feeling too good? It's the guy that still hit the ground. So you have to have a buffer zone or a safety factor. And most manufacturers recommend you have a safety factor of at least three feet. So taking a look at my example here, if I'm gonna use a standard six foot liner with a shock pack, I better be 19 feet off that ground. If I'm anything lower, guess what? Doesn't work. Can I get lower heights? Absolutely. A retractable will get you working at a lower height. A vertical lifeline can help you work at a lower height. You can use a scaffold. You can use an extension or an A-frame ladder, but not everything works with the $40 lanyard people buy. So here are some different example of when they call lifelines. If you look at the picture of the left, that's a vertical lifeline. It runs from the top down or, or from the pitch of the roof towards the edge. And that has a rope grab on it. Now the picture on the right hand side, that yellow line is considered a horizontal lifeline. Horizontal lifelines are, are useful and cool and dangerous all at the same time. You connect to that line and it allows you to walk across larger distances keeping you tied off to the line at all times. Now they are useful. Again, they are not the most cost effective depending on your situation, but you can start to think of, well, where can that be beneficial? If I got a 400 foot warehouse roof, I'm not gonna install anchor points every five, 10, 15 feet. I can install horizontal lifeline anchor points every hundred feet. And guess what? I only need five now, or I only need six now it may be uh, working in your benefit. So take a look at this little picture in this diagram here. I have a guy who is tied off with a sufficiently short lanyard that has no shock back on it to an anchor point at the center of the roof. Now, because he does not reach the edge, he is in a fall restraint system, which means his anchor point needs to be able to withstand 1,000 pounds. So he is compliant working here. See, the problem with him working here is he has limited mobility. He can really walk circles around his anchor point and no more. Now imagine that I said, uh, hey, Jim, I need you to actually work in this area up here or maybe even work to this corner. Well, what are his options? Can I give him a long rope like this one here on the right-hand side of the screen? Can I give him a long rope and say, hey, go for broke, stretch it out? Um, possibly, or if you see actually in this image is I can just install more anchor points so that he can unclip and clip to the next one. It is not illegal to unclip from one anchor point 
to transfer to another anchor point. Just keep that in mind. You can be untied off to do the transition. Now, some companies have their own policy where it says, no, we require 100% tie off. And in those cases, then you have to tie off with a double legged lanyard, maybe use a horizontal lifeline. But in the OSHA standard, I can install as many as I want and, and hop and jump to and from as I please. Okay, but if you didn't want to install the anchor point or, or multiple anchor points and I did give him that extended rope, see the problem is he'll be able to reach the edge, but what happens when he falls? What happens when he slips and slides down the roof? He typically ends up somewhere here, right? So then another option is I could put a horizontal lifeline right up there. He can clip to the steel cable or rope depending on what it was made from tie off with his same sufficiently short lanyard if he wanted to or a retractable to the line and then he'd be able to walk the entire distance of the roof okay so this is just another option you can use take a look at this gentleman here so <laughs> what they're trying to do is test out the strength of the retractable they wanted to see does it actually lock up now take a look at this guy's harness first and foremost where is his dorsal d-ring way too low his pelvic strap is creating slight man thong for him and retractables are design are designed to lock up when you reach three and a half miles an hour some go up to five miles an hour so what this guy's plan was is i'll run to see if it works and uh, let's see if he gets any hang time perfect so not a good way to test out the retractable. Um, they actually have ways to test it out and they show you in the manufacturer's tabulated data. So keep that in mind. So in conclusion to this class, you guys are almost there. You have to remember that you have to use approved anchor points and approved means it will sufficiently support the weight without failing. You have to always make sure the fall protection is sufficient for the job. Do I have a harness in good working order? Do I have the appropriate connecting device? Is my lanyard sufficiently short to where I'm not going to bounce off the ground? Um, you have, do not use any fall protection. Oh, it says, I'm sorry. Inspect your fall protection system prior to each use. Do not use fall protection systems to carry materials or, or tools. And then remember, always tie off when coming within six feet of an unprotected edge. Now you're gonna see a little QR code on your screen. If you want, it's a good time to pause. This QR code is just a little survey. So if you use a smart device, an iPad, an iPhone, a Samsung Galaxy, and you just turn your camera on and you point it to the QR code, It'll take you to a uh, Google QR code docs, and then you can answer a short five question survey. And I want you to be honest about it. This is how I can improve the training. How did I like the class? You know what? I'd rather see Matt's handsome instructor self in my, in my office. We all know that currently with the COVID-19 situation, social distancing, um, staying inside to minimize and flatten the curve, we're all trying to do our part um help me to help you i still want to make sure you guys get certified i am going to return so that you guys can see me uh, we'll finish you guys off here and uh yeah any questions best way is just to shoot me an email uh, you can shoot it to my personal email it's uh, matthew hiraga at gmail.com so m-a-t-t-h-e-w-h-i-r-a-g-a -T -T -E at gmail.com um, you can text me at my work email. It is Matthew at UnitechHawaii.com. U-N-I-T-E-K-H-A-W-A-I-I.com. I appreciate your time. I will be sending out the written exam that you're going to be taking. Uh, we're going to supervise how that's taken. And then uh, get back to me. Call me up with any questions you have. Any uh, improvements is uh, much appreciated. Shoot me an email. I only get 400 a day, so that'll work out. For now, signing off.